Hi everyone, welcome abroad. This is Israel Reality Podcast. Today, this is I'm Gilad Kumer, Neil Kumer's son. Um, I'm going to interview my dear friend Nadav. I'm going to dive into that right away. So hi Nadav Chachab, hi Nadav, my good friend. How have you been doing? Hi, hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a little bit great about... to see you from afar, from afar uh, for a long time. Yeah, so a little bit about me and Nadav. So me and Nadav are actually good friends from high school. Um, Nadav now is in London, but I'm going to give him a real um, intro. But before that, just a little story about Nadav Chacham to get uh, kind of the understand the persona, the character. So we were in high school. I don't know if you remember this in the history class. So I, I opened, uh, me and Nadav, we sat next to each other. This is in 10th grade. And I opened my history books uh, for just normal uh, high school curriculum in Israel. And Nadav has his university uh, book open because he already started university at the age of, what, 15? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, like 15, he says, oh, you, you can close, close, close your history books. It's, uh, it's, studio. it's nonsense. And uh, you should le- le- learn this. It's more serious. <laughs> so with, with that introduction, a few words about Adav Chacham. So Adav Chacham, in the last past year, Adav and his wife have been um, leading the young community of St. John's Wood Synagogue in London. Did I say that correctly? Yep. And he's also definitely. a strategic consultant specializing in the public sector. Nadav is also alumni of the fancy unit um, 8200 that just now now got credit for what happened in Lebanon. And uh, we don't know, actually, I, maybe I shouldn't say that on air. And um, also he has worked in the past with the defense, uh, Israel Defense and the Security Forum, also known as Habit Chonisti. So Nadav, how are you today? I'm very good. Thanks for asking. How are you? Great. How great. is Israel the day after... Uh... Yeah, supposedly yeah. attack in Lebanon. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. So we we we've we've we felt the chaos here. We I, I thought the attack was brilliant. Um, it's like strategic. It gets it gets every every pail uh, Hezbollah every uh, um, Hezbollah member has the, the beeper. Um, even though the you know Hezbollah say that the casualties are not are not too um, uh, too bad and only uh, what was it ten were killed. But a few hundred that are injured, and it seems like a direct uh, hit. And I also didn't see, I didn't hear about a lot of civilian cases. So I guess it's, it sounds successful to me. And you take yeah, about you, it. You can, yeah, you can be sure that in the international media, they already spoke about uh, Hezbollah workers who get injured because of uh, oh, okay. the pagers. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, today we're going we're gonna to go through a few different topics. Um, the, the main thing I think is really the, th- um, theological, uh, stance of Hamas and how, with his views, how does it justify the cruel and horrible things that he de- he de- the organization has done. So before we jump into that, so Dov, you've been living in London for the past year, um, and you, you moved there actually before the conflict started, right? When did, when did you move right. to London? Right. August, August, 2023. Yeah, so I, I know the rise of anti-Semitism. Obviously, after seventh October, is entirely different. The game, the ball, cha- the ball game has changed entirely. So, what, what is your take of anti-Semitism um, since you got there? Um, the changes before October seventh and after. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it's been a year here in London, um, and I will answer your question with something, and then I will say the exact opposite. So, generally speaking. Good. Yeah, uh, very clear. Generally speaking, the situation is overall good. You know, I'm living my life. I live in my house every morning. I'm going to the office. I don't interact with anyone who's blaming me for genocide or uh, doing anything. Um, So the day-to-day life is pretty normal, although some people, I think in the beginning of the war in Israel, people saw what's happening in the streets of London. They were like, are you okay? Like, yeah, we are pretty okay. You, You are guys you are in, in the middle of a war right we are okay um, yeah, everything is relative you know everybody feels, everybody, relative. everybody feels sorry for everyone yeah exactly exactly um so that's overall pretty okay on the other hand i think it's not very much okay um and i'm saying that because i personally experienced a few incidents nothing terrible but a few people shouted at me some of them in arabic they imagine I wouldn't understand, but... Yeah, but you, you actually understand, understand. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they don't know uh, you're missing. They see what well, uh, Ashkenazi Jew, and they, don't, they assume he doesn't understand exactly, Arabic. Exactly, exactly. But they don't, yeah. know, they don't know about your past, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, from a personal experience, but more importantly, I think 
one can't ignore symbols, flags, the general feeling going out in the streets that you can't identify as Israeli for sure, even as Jewish. Um, and it's not very comfortable. It's not very comfortable seeing people in the streets wearing kafia or in the tube wearing the kafia. Um, and the feeling is that something is going on underneath the surface. And it's terrifying. It's worrying. And we don't know what's, what comes next. Well, it's terrifying because um, it's like uncertainty. You, you, don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. Like, why, why is it ter- What's terrifying about that experience? I think the uncertainty and the understanding that the British society in general is changing, fundamentally changing. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen later mm-hmm. on right in in the uk for example the uk is a good example before only five years ago the candidate for prime minister of the labor party was a clear anti-semite right jeremy corbyn wasn't a left-wing activist or a left-wing radical he was anti-semite um mm-hmm. and lucky enough he didn't win and he left the party and everything happened later on but still it's possible that something bad will happen and if we know about processes and it takes time and it boils it's not immediately everything is exploding um so yeah so i think people are worried and they have good reason to be worried yeah if, if you compare it this question i thought about now if you compare it like uh obviously there's a, it's a big comparison but before the holocaust when the start things started to arise and uh um i guess the beginning of the 30s or even the late 20s do you do you kind of feel like Uh, movements happening like what what's what yeah what's what's the atmosphere just like of the movement i think it's hard to compare um although there are some points that are similar and we need to be aware of uh, for example we had an interesting story about the event with Douglas Murray mm-hmm. uh, who was supposed to be speaking in a theater in central london one of the many theaters in central london for an event of uh, by the technion friend uh, in the uk and in the morning of the event the theater called the organizers and told them listen we can't do this our employees are not showing up and we got threats and we can't do it the, the event is cancelled so they called us on sunday they asked us can you host an event with douglas murray and 800 people well, when you, when you like, say us you wouldn't say us you mean the community the community the community the yeah. shul yeah okay the shul we have a, we, we are a big shul in central london we have mm-hmm. a big hall way too much too big like uh, we don't <laughs> hall. anyway um so think so it's way too us. big yeah okay yeah it's way too big Uh, they called us and they asked if we can host an event with 800 people four hours later. Wow. Well, we told them, of course, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> an experience, you know. But And then when Douglas Murray came and everyone showed up for the event in our synagogue, it was really nice and beautiful. But I was thinking to myself, it's great for us as a community. It's not a great story for the Jewish community at large. It's not great that the Jewish community needs to move to inside its own borders, the, inside its own fences, yeah. uh, in order to, to have an event with Douglas yeah, Murray. Yeah, that, that's scary. Well that's scary. It's, yeah. When, you, when, Joe, when, Jews, yeah, when Jews have to crowd up, and, yeah, it really is scary. Yeah, stay in their community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do, do, you feel like, do you feel like the government... Oh, do you want to say anything before I... No, no, no. Okay. I just think do you, do you feel like what, what do you feel like the government's been done I just heard this podcast uh, actually just randomly on the, I was on the way from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem now uh, by the way we're broadcasting from Jerusalem so and I heard that this podcast she goes on and on European um, European Jew that the differences between before the 7th of October and after 7th of October but in, in the sense of the government involvement so how how involved is the UK government in Um, obviously there's laws against anti-semitism um, the regulation so how involved are they in your sense as being a community leader there in London how involved they, they are involved are they effective no um, and that's true for both the previous government the conservative one and the labor one mm-hmm. um, the labor one that is now in office since uh, July um, I think in general we feel that the The government try to help Jewish community stay safe in terms of providing them with resources and funding and everything they need to uh, protect themselves mm. 
but they don't do much in order to make Jews feel welcome in the public sphere. And that's quite different. Um, for example, the police seem quite reluctant mm -hmm. to confront certain protests, especially those in central London every Shabbat, where we clearly witness open support for terrorism, not just Hamas, also Al-Qaeda and even ISIS. Um, people are documented making disturbing statements you can't even imagine. Um, yet the police appear too afraid um, to to do something. To well, what does that mean, afraid? Like you're just standing there, not getting involved? Just standing there, they don't do anything. They don't arrest anyone. They just want the event to finish, everyone to go home, and they yeah. can say that another week has passed. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's not great, you know, when, you, when your police is... Uh, is not willing to confront the bad guys, that, that's a problem, and especially when it comes to Jews and to Jewish identity in the public sphere. Jewish people, like, I'm not going anywhere in Shabbat afternoon, I'm probably after a whiskey or two, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm not interested in going to central London, but people who are going to central London, Israeli tourists, Jews in the area, there's the Jewish community in Marble Arch, which is exactly where the protests are yeah. usually happening, um, they need to finish their service earlier because the police literally told them we can't protect you during the, the protest. So please do your Jewish things early well, enough that's insane. so you can go home. That's insane. I, I guess I don't know if that happens in New York yet, but that's that. I don't know, just from a perspective of a Jew who, who also grew up religious and uh, traveled around Europe and America and being Jewish on Shabbat, that seems, that seems pretty insane that you're restricted on certain hours and they, they have a... Uh, Different preferences for you, preferences, yeah. Yep, yep. yeah. So you, you, you did, I, I know I have a little insight. I did also a little intelligence, and I know you did um, uh, a little bit of research about the numbers and anti-Semitism in Europe, right? Yep. I... So if you want to, yeah, if you want to shoot out some numbers and also, yeah, we want to get, oh, okay, so let's start with that. Yeah, we'll I think people, people love numbers, uh, although I'm not sure it's like it tells the entire story, but just for example we can see here in the uk according to the cst the community security trust uh run by the jewish community um there is a rise of from um 1662 events of anti-semitism in 1000 wait say it again 1000 1 1662 yeah. events in wow. 2022 but what, what's, yeah do you, okay mm -hmm. that's 2022 wait in 2023, we're speaking about 4,100. Wow. It's more double, more than double the, the uh, event. Wow. It's like triple, um, According yeah. to the police, to the Met Police, the London Police, um, that's only specifically a certain month, the October 2022, comparing with October 2023, uh, we speak about a rise from 28 to 408 events reported wow. to the police. We should remember that the more people are alerted, the more people also report and everything. Yeah. The numbers are telling some story. Yeah, um, I guess I guess it makes sense. Yeah, if you also I heard all these testimonials, also anti-Semitism before, even in 9/11. That's crazy. Yeah, after 9/11, before 9/11. Yeah, so I guess it's it's similar, but not really similar. Yeah. Never like this. Yeah. This unprecedented never happened in the history of the Jews in Israel. Such an event. Yeah. What are, what are right. You, mm -hmm. So we can we can go on and on like we in France we see a rise from 436 event in 2022 to 1676 event in 2023 in Germany um from 840 to 1270 um and you can you can find the same data basically for every European country or in America, in America, I assume that the, the numbers are similar or the phenomenon in general is similar. Um, so, yeah, we, the, the numbers are clear. What yeah, the numbers sure, mean, yeah. that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, for sure, history, we know history is like, this is a point in history that changed our life. Even if you feel it as citizen in Israel, also Jews abroad, I, I, I'm almost positive that before the 7th of October and after 7th of October, our lives have changed from A to Z sure. in almost like every aspect, just uh, from it's just a general feeling of uh, being a Jew in Israel and uh, being a Jew abroad, a uh, sense of security and uh, to even like personal small things, how our, just our life has changed in Israel. 
uh, friends who were in uh, in Miluim on and off in reserves on and off, and that's that's her life. It's like you have to you have to run a career, be a student, have small kids, and simultaneously uh, be an army. So everybody in Israel has two hats. That's pretty yeah. pretty insane. Yeah, I will tell you something. My, my marketing secrets here. Ah, that okay. uh, before. Uh, if it's before too secret, we don't want to know. Yeah, okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. That's <laughs> the part you you can know. Okay. Um, before the war started, it was very and convenience to speak about Israel in the community for a good reason. Remember, everything happened in Israel before the war. Um, and since the war started, basically every event has to do something with Israel. Um, so that's whatever you want to do in the community, just add Israel into it and everyone will come. Um, <laughs> and it's funny, but it's also very serious because people understand the crisis understand the need and they feel the need themselves they feel they want to be part of something bigger and they will be part of whatever going on mm -hmm. uh, and they feel the community can provide something to them in in the situation that we all experience yeah, so, mm -hmm. so what did jews in the uk feel like they have to do actively obviously everybody has this kind of everybody every day where we are in israel and abroad you have this kind of guilt and you have to do things towards israel towards the situation what, what do you think jews in your community and maybe even your in general like feel like they have to do or what are they doing since since the 7th of october so they do everything basically from donating money going to solidarity trips um hosting families coming to israel hosting hostages families coming to our community wow. um really literally everything everything i think the unique part about being abroad is that you need to confront with what's going on in your society as well as what's going on in Israel. And that's mm -hmm. quite unique uh, because, as we said, there are many Palestinian protests in the streets of London. Um, there were a few Jewish protests, I will say, or pro-Israeli protests, but usually um, it was in a certain area in London, in a very highly controlled environment with the police cordoning off the, the area yeah. um and and the jews themselves are walking down the streets and having israeli flag etc um but i think something has changed in the past few months um since um a screening of uh, the film about the nova festival took place mm. in a cinema in london and oh. the day before uh pro-Palestinian group decided to protest in front of the cinema and they also vandalized the cinema. That's and crazy. Speaking, yeah, that's I mean, crazy. We're yeah. speaking about a movie about this is like a music festival in... that people go to have fun and yeah, this is crazy. Exactly. It's not a movie about uh, Israeli defense forces or anything like that. And I think the rage about what happened in this specific case um caused many many british jews to leave their houses and come wow. in a counter protest and how, in, how rare is that cinema how rare is that how rare is it so a british jew rare. to leave the house like i don't know how uh, like culturally how rare is that or is it a pretty active community? i think it's rare it's rare because generally speaking um we are not uh looking for trouble let's say <laughs> um and and uh we don't want to confront we don't want to to confront the pallies, as they call them here. Um, what, what's wait, what's pallies? Pallies, Palestinians. Oh, pa okay. Pallies, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the nickname. Yeah, um, I've never heard that one before. It's the first time for okay. me. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Uh, um, but, and also, they are scared and afraid because sometimes these events are turning up to be violent. So, it's not very common for this to happen. But, a week or two after this event happened, we realized that there is a pro-Palestinian protest every Friday, uh, very nearby, next to our community. And, the, and this is this is a Swiss cottage, yeah. This is Swiss cottage. This is you, a place you, so Swiss yes. Cottage. Okay, so yeah, explain a little bit about that and what what Swiss cottage is. And, mm -hmm. So Swiss cottage is a random place in London. Um, the unique thing about it is that it's at the end of the street where the ambassador's uh, house is. Mm. Um, so the Palestinians started a protest in front of the ambassador's house, but uh, the police pushed them farther away to the end of the street. Um, and since the very beginning of the war, they protest there every week. 
And at some point we realized that they are there every Friday and mm-hmm. we said to ourselves, wait a second, why don't we come and uh, start a counter protest? <laughs> so in the first time we were seven people with uh, some, you know, um, our phones and we tried to play music and to shout at them. <laughs> It wasn't yeah. very successful. Yeah, nice, um, nice Ashkenazi Jews in London. Na- see, yeah. Exactly, nice uh, Ashkenazi Jews in London. Yeah. But since then, a uh, few serious people took control over it, and, and it's really growing every week. And we are now outnumbered them, I think. In the past really? That's insane. Three, three months, we outnumber them every week. They are very, very annoyed at us. And they how, how many are you? Uh, how many are you today? Sorry, we are 100, 150 people each wow, week. Wow, that's that's nice numbers for yeah. Okay, that's nice numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it's also and and I, I think it's very important because pro Palestinian protest was a pure example of gaslighting of Jewish identity because they know they are in a relatively Jewish area, so they didn't say anything about Jews, of course. But vice versa, they said we are. We, they, they have a banner says um, that they belong to something called International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. <laughs> well, it's I a, assume the, such there a are fancy some... name for anti-Semitism. Huh? Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Ex- exactly. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there are real Jews in the crowd on the other side. Maybe one or two. Um, and they also have something. Um, related to sport. They have Spurs fun against genocide Spurs. The Tottenham Hotspurs is the football club uh, that identifies yeah, the Jewish yeah. community in mm-hmm. London. Um, so it's clearly comes to say, uh, to send very interesting message that the message is, we are the real Jews. Your Jewishness, like our Jewish, our Jewishness, the Zionist, the, the Jewish community in St. John's Wood and everyone else, you're all fake. You're you know, you, you're supporting Israel. Uh-huh. Um, so your Jewish identity is basically fake. And we want to take um, ownership over the Jewish identity. The, the Palestinians so, want to take o- o- ownership over the Jewish identity? Of course, because that's how they can separate between anti-Semitism, which is not allowed. No one want to be anti-Semite today. It's not so, very popular. And anti-Zionism. And anti-Zionism. Uh-huh. Anti-Zionism uh-huh. is quite popular. Um, so they say we are not anti-Jews. We are Jews. We uh, are Jewish. Our protest is uh, Jewish. We 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 emphasize Jewish values. That's that's an interesting um, approach. Yeah, I, I guess I guess it's very trendy today to be anti anti Zionist and anti Semit anti yeah anti Semit. Yep, yeah. yeah. So, and then they had to confront with real Jews coming every week, and. <laughs> having Israeli flags and Israeli music and, and, and Jewish songs and a Chabad rabbi asking people if they want to have tefillin because <laughs> that's, what, that, oh. that's amazing. Whatever you, there, there is a group bigger than 10 Jews together, a Chabad rabbi will find its way to that. Oh, that that's, a good, that's a scene right there, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting every Friday. And it's also a good example for the Jewish, for, for Jews worldwide, because alongside the Chabad rabbi, we also have every week uh, some uh, pride flags. And, uh, really? and I, I remember, I don't think I have the picture. Maybe I, I do have it. Yeah. The Chabad rabbi took picture with the woman with the uh, pride flag. So yeah, he whenever t- he took we a have in, it, in, a, in a good way, yeah, he was like supportive. in a good way, of course, of really, course. They're yeah. like they're coming together, and uh, they all uh, we all together in it. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I, I don't basically... know if that happened in Israel, but yeah, I, I, uh, no, exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, that was my uh, <laughs> that was your intention. Very, yeah, yeah, uh, thin criticism of Israel, but uh, anyway, it was. I think it's very important because people see. Israeli flags alongside Palestinian flags. The story has two sides. And for the average British people, they usually see the Palestinian flag. Yeah, they, they usually don't. see the BBC. They don't see Israeli flags and they don't see Jewish people standing out and saying, we are proud of who we are and we support Israel. And we think that terrorist supporters are not welcome on the streets of London. Yeah. So I guess, I guess it's, a, it's a number game that you like. How do you how do you beat that number game? Like it's like a billion. You can't beat yeah. the number game. Yeah. Um, and specifically in Swiss cottage, the Pallies uh, are a very small group. Um, so it, you can't beat the number game. You only need to be there to show yourself 
um, and and to make sure everyone knows that Jewish people are in London and they are proud to be in London and they are proud to to carry Israeli flags and they are not afraid. Um, no, you can't be the the number game in central London every Shabbat. Um, back in November or December, there were some three hundred thousand people there. So of course wow. that's bigger than the entire. Uh, British Jewish community, so wow. uh, you can't really win. That. How, how big? How big is the Jewish community in all of the UK? I think two hundred fifty k. I'm not sure. Okay, okay, we can look no. it up after. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and okay, so wow, interesting. So I have, I have a question for you. At the beginning of the war, you wrote uh, an article for the journal Hashiloch, and you addressed there. Um, understanding of the crisis and the weakness of uh, liberalism and the strategy of the of of Hamas and their theological uh, beliefs uh, of radical Islam and how with the beliefs of radical Islam do they justify their actions so you have there you made there a few points so it'd be great for me and for listeners if you can maybe dive in to that and try to let's try to break it down how do you really I don't know how but how do you justify such horrible actions with with the radical belief. Yeah, so yeah, you take me back to the beginning of the war. Um, I think something we all felt since the very, very beginning that something is, is going wrong in the world. There is a crisis in the Western world and this crisis is manipulated or <laughs> leveraged by the bad guys who are Hamas and Iran and Russia, of course, and, and, and everyone else. So uh, I wanna start with an interesting example, and we can go from there to speak about the deeper ideas. If you remember uh, the date, April 14th, that was uh, Shabbat, and in Motzei Shabbat, we got the uh, notifications that um, Iran fired a few hundred missiles and rockets and drones. It took them a while. We had uh, yeah. <laughs> time uh, to wait and prepare ourselves. Yeah, just, um, yeah. Just, just on a personal note, I remember they said nine hours. So like people just didn't know what to do with themselves. So like, okay, maybe it's a good good time to clean the house, start cooking. <laughs> it's not like you, exactly. you, in Israel or we are day to day lives. When you hear missiles, you have like it depends where you are. You have between fifteen seconds and a minute and a half. So here you had nine hours. So what are you supposed to do with yeah. nine hours? So yeah, people are kind of going crazy. I stayed up all night. Just because I was yeah. like really curious, I'd work this next day, but I was just too curious to know what happened. Yeah, okay, so yeah. they have to keep on. Yeah. So we we made pizza the same evening, so uh. we heard we have like three hours. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I think the pizza will be ready. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can make yeah more um, sophisticated things than pizza, mafroom, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So one of the most interesting thing happened that night was uh, we saw um, Israel intercepted basically every missile and every drone. Um, some of them above the um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Temple Mount. And you saw pictures of one of the holiest place for Islam yeah. with rockets coming, rockets and missiles coming from Muslim country yeah. and Israel intercepting them. The, the, the so, iconic picture, yeah. The iconic picture, exactly. So you like, you tell yourself, wait a minute. Are they trying to bomb the mosque? Maybe, 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 maybe I'll pull it up a second. Maybe I'll put it up, the picture. So from, from our perspective, we were like, you're, you're mad. You're mad. What are you doing? Like, how can you <laughs> fire rockets on the place you see as one of the holiest places for Islam? Like, what would, hap what, what would have happened if we wouldn't intercept these, these missiles? The following day, in some Iranian newspaper, the illustration, the graphic they made was very interesting. They actually captured the, the very same scene um, and they, they made the um, intercepted uh, missiles and drones as, you know, some rocks, firing rocks, something like mystical, um, like, um, some sort of miracle that uh, rocks are firing and going towards um, the uh, mosque. the Alaksa mosque, and I was very confused for a second because I'm like, <laughs> these rocks that you like, okay, you made an interpretation that these rocks are not only coming from Iran, but they coming from God, but they are going in direction towards the place um, you see as holy. 
And one should understand the, the historical and religious uh, context of it, because in one of the stories in Quran, um, the Quran tells us about a war between uh, Muhammad and the Ethiopian army. And during the war, God helped Muhammad but by firing uh, these rocks from, from sky on the elephants of the Ethiopian army. Mm -hmm. Um, and this, uh, they call them Tairana Babil. And uh, this is a very famous name for uh, Hamas drones are named after this uh, Ababil thing. So in their concept, what happened was God led the rockets, the missiles towards the place. God fought for them. And of course it wouldn't bomb the mosque because God is fighting for them. Right, right. Um, and, and, and but they are very proud of the fact that on top of the Laksa Mosque, we could have seen uh, the Iranian missile. So their understanding of reality is totally different than our understanding. Their, you know, incentive systems is totally different than ours because we were thinking it's it's stupid, it's, a, it's mad. Yeah, it's, a, it's a biggest they, moron. Yeah, it's like it doesn't make any it, sense. It's exactly. contradicting all their values and they and for them it's part of their values that, that's yeah it's part of the way they understand history and and we saw it the example i used in my article that was written before this event um is a hamas senior official said very openly uh, he was denying any moral responsibility for their own people their own palestinian people he said of course we build the tunnel for ourselves because the UN and Israel are responsible for the citizens. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, okay. And I think this time there is another element. It's not just because they believe Allah is protecting them. It's also because they, they've embraced the progressive narrative of the oppressed. Right. You know, one that absolves them from any moral responsibility and in their view, the only one to be blamed is the oppressors main named Israel or the US or the UN or right. whatever Western guy you want to play. And blame. this is all part of the misconception of we, we just don't understand them. Like we think we understand them, but we, we, we think they're Western and we think they uh, they have values. They want humanitarian aid. They they don't want that at all. They're not interested in that. They don't, they don't care. Right. They, they, they have adopted, their, yeah. Right. They adopted very specific elements of Western um, values. Most of them aren't very liberal because they're coming from the progressive thinking that is not liberal at all. Mm -hmm. um, and if you combine it with their theological beliefs about the God directing them and the, the process of history, the historical process, they are part of an historical drama that is unfolding in front of our eyes. So it doesn't matter if 70% of the house in, in Gaza are unlivable right it, who cares we are part of a redemption process leave, it's all, it's leave all, alone all the other elements yeah the small details of like people dying and you're shooting from hospitals and schools or not doesn't really matter the small details are bullshit they, you, you, they, they you care about even mm -hmm. glorify them because wow. death unlike in judaism christianity is quite complicated but in judaism you don't glorify dead but in islam you glorify the death you, you glorify shahada you glorify right. istishad um, in the name of God. And and that's very easy. It solves all the problem, right? If you die, you are a martyr. If you don't die, you you are a martyr alive. You you <laughs> are a symbol of resilience and resistance. Um so you know, it's very easy to win that way. Yeah, you can't you can't really lose. Yeah, it's it's right. a, it's a pretty bulletproof the whole system. So right. it's I'm I'm like scared like in a personal question. I also we had I had a discussion not not too not too much after the seventh of October. That I was like scared of the Western values and saying that, like I don't know what what's the Western values today: development, freedom, liberty, um, technology, and and they and their belief is so they're so radical and they're they're so motivated. And another story that I had friends who work with journalists also worked with journalists a little bit after the seventh of October, and um, and they said that uh, a friend of mine saw that they saw writing in uh, the Hamas in the Nukba the. The Nukba soldiers, the Nukba terrorists, who who came uh, who came the seventh October to the kibbutzim, they found like these certificates of they completing like this Quran uh, course. So they're they're so highly motivated, and they're uh, they're locked in, and they're 
so how do, how do we how do we fight that because it doesn't seem it doesn't seem if you speak to the random 18 year old in the western society in europe in america and israel maybe in israel now more than ever but um how, how how do we win that such a strong ideology that's so motivated so fl- fired up uh, that's a big question um, yeah yeah you know, you, you, know, you can you can answer it in parts yeah yeah no so so let's start by saying that um oh, first i think the question how is complicated i'm not sure i have a full plan to offer well, you right oh now. you don't you have a full plan to uh, eliminate no, all radical all. radical beliefs in the world no all the bad guys we can call I, I, spider-man I, I, and i Avengers thought i thought you were like in a good unit army i thought you already thought about know. this thing. <laughs> sorry sorry but i can help you with ideas that's what ah, i'm okay. doing the best um yeah uh, but I'm, i really think that in order to answer the uh, the how question we need to understand the what and why and w- what's happening and why it is so dangerous um and i think we we actually said a few things already so let's frame them in in a specific context um for example the misuse of language um, we hear here in London and the US and everywhere else, we hear the term anti-racism as part of the protest movement or whatever. And we know that in our context, it essentially means anti-Zionism and maybe more broadly anti-white people. It's not anti any source of racism, right? Yeah. The West, the West uh, is next. Like, like we the used West to say. is next. Exactly. We, used to say, we used to say that after uh, October 7th. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Social justice is not very justice. <laughs> um, so it's like kind of more revenge kind of thing. Um, so in other words, from the very outset, we understand that there is a problem with the language we use because certain words in the Western public discourse nowadays, they don't know that, that they, they're not longer represent what we think they should. So that, that's a big problem. And, and one of the supposed strengths of a Western society is its passion for truth, right? That's why we have universities, we have freedom of speech and, and commitment to critical thinking. We think that if we will try to to reach the truth we we will be smarter stronger um more stable and everything it seems truth today has become more tricky than ever with everything that's happening and technology and ai and just everything that's happening uh, it's very hard it's very hard but if we like we, we believe that these values are are essential to our society's progress right but if we are unable to use words in a coherent way, we <laughs> face a serious problem. We lose the ability to recognize and understand much of what's happening around us. We can't describe what's going on. We can't tell someone else what, what, what's happening. Yeah, like, lang- what language is today is, is, is a tricky thing, a tricky thing when you can, uh, you can identify as anything, I guess, or you can, you can, right. you can make a generate. Yeah. yeah, you can. And that, that brings me to, to a second point. And the second point is institutions. We all know the UN, the International Court of Justice. It seems like the non-Western world has very easily learned how to manipulate these Western institutions. It's Mm -hmm. right with, for example, uh, something from a totally different perspective with copyrights in China, right? Mm -hmm. China does not respect copyrights. (laughs) So what do we do? We respect copyrights, but they don't. So... (laughs) how to play yeah it's, um, it's a tricky game if like one guy plays by the rules one doesn't so it becomes exactly. more tricky if someone if someone plays football and can touch with his hand so that's quite difficult to win wait you mean um, football is in soccer right okay football as uh, football yeah. there's only one football right right country. i'm asking you please um <laughs> Uh, in the un that's very clear what's going on there and and let's take one example that from something that is close to us the president of the International Court of Justice. Do you know who is he My, today? I, no, no. Personally, I don't. Okay, okay. No, I, I prepared ahead of time. Don't oh, worry. okay. Um, <laughs> his name is a very lovely guy named uh, Nawaf Salam. Um, he's uh, even if I remember that, if I remember who it is, I probably wouldn't manage to pronounce him. Yeah, pronounce the name correctly. Yeah, okay. Nawaf Salam. <laughs> Nawaf Salam. He is from Lebanon. Um, he was formerly Lebanon's ambassador to the UN. This is the man 
now overseeing the case against Israel, right? While his own country is part of the <laughs> conflict. Oh, yeah. And he previously voted 200 something times against Israel in the UN. So how can it be? How yeah, can it, it be? Sa- it sounds like the China copywriting thing. Sounds like yeah. a pretty good analogy. Yeah, yeah. So why, why is that happening? But it's important. Why is that happening? Because I think there is a belief that people can rise above their national identity. They can purify themselves right. from these elements and focus solely on the interest of humanity right. as, as a whole. It's right? like humanity, identity, like, you, uh, you know, um, yeah, there's that famous book. Um, that um, the world, yeah, solidarity is near, and we're all going to be one. Is going to be many nations, right? Exactly. Imagine all the people, blah blah blah. Yeah, <laughs> we all know. Very famous. I live right next door to the Beatles' uh, uh, zebra crossing, so uh, uh, very okay. famous. Um, <laughs> anyway, funny. Nawaf Salam, this yeah. this lovely guy, he is a uh, part of a group of alumni of the West's most prestigious institutions, the Harvard University and Yale and, and Columbia and everything else. And they become part of this global elite that looks down on nationalism, religion, family, community identity, uh, values that are increasingly seen as objectionable in the modern Western world. Yeah. Even though What's it's a yeah. deeper problem, more than that, the people who don't come from the West, like our guy in the Waf, yeah, often hold fa- firmly to their identity, right? Their right. national, religious, everything else, their identity, and they aren't ashamed of it. Only us in the West, we see this tendency towards shame about our identity. identity. I, I think it's super popular in Europe. I just been a uh, small disclaimer. I just came back from two months traveling in uh, Sri Lanka and India. And you see that every European you speak to, nobody's proud of their nation. Nobody cares where they, if they came from uh, UK or France or Spain or Italy, they don't care. They're it's all about their... food. Like it's a comparison yeah. of uh, what, which food is better. Yeah. Like nobody, if you like, nobody cares about what's happening in their country. The news is like this universal kind of trend that everybody's one everybody's can go anywhere anybody can work from everywhere um location is like not not key anymore and it's like and you can really see it like nobody at least our generation uh um i guess people are like in their 20s uh, maybe early 30s like nobody cares no nobody wants to identify and uh, nobody has any pride also from where they're from yeah yeah, yeah. so so the identity uh, seem to be something people don't want to to embrace they want to set aside and iran hamas all the other bad guys they, they, love, identity. they love their identity yeah. they love their identity <laughs> and they also know they understand how the institutions in the west are working yeah. and they know how to manipulate the system as part of their biggest strategy hamas speaking about human rights and genocide like why the heck <laughs> who are you to speak about human rights and genocide but if you don't mind like you don't have any like yeah. set of priorities of whose whose culture, whose identity is more stable, more peaceful. Yeah, for so, sure. They yeah. they played the way thing so well. They learned the rules really fast. They understood how the new West uh, works, and they learned the rules, and they they turned it to, towards them. And they now like not towards them. They use it. They, they leverage themselves. Yeah. And now they they understand the rules better than anybody because just by understanding these rules, they leverage themselves to such a point that the they're the underdog and uh, and only yeah. they can have an identity and everybody else, if they have an identity, it's it's cruelty and it's... Yeah, communism. that's the progressive yeah. world, right? It's like the narrative of oppressed versus uh, right. oppressors and only the oppressed are allowed to to mention, to, to preserve their identity while the oppressors are required to, I don't know, to <laughs> surrender <laughs> their identity. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, only uh, only uh, like I said, only if you're an underdog you can have identity. If you're like a big nation, you come from like a big place, you were an empire once, you're a colonist, you're evil, and you should probably forget your identity because um you you did bad things in the past. So right, why why, right. why remember it? Exactly, yeah. and that and that's quite amazing. Um, I from a different perspective about the uh, the crisis in the West, I wanted to 
uh, quote something that a very famous journalist wrote. Um, this guy named uh, Thomas Friedman, you might heard of him, yeah. um, <laughs> in the New York Times a few months ago. It's amazing. You, you'll be shocked. Um, he basically, since the few months ago, he calls for immediate ceasefire and withdrawal of Israeli forces from, uh, from Gaza. Um, and he said as the following, I'm quoting now. Yes, yes, I can hear the criticism from the war hawks right now. Friedman, you would let Hamas's leader, Yichia Sinwar, come out of his tunnel and declare victory? Yes, I would. <laughs> in fact, I wish I could be at the news conference in Gaza when he does, so I could <laughs> ask him the first question. Okay. Mr. Sinwar, <laughs> you claim that it is a great victory for Hamas, a total Israeli withdrawal and a stable ceasefire. I just want to know, what existed on October 6 between you and Israel before you surprise attack? Oh, let me answer that. A total Israeli withdrawal from Gaza and a stable ceasefire. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'd like to stick around for a few days to watch you explain to Gazans how you started an eight-month war, now 12 months, yeah. causing the destruction of roughly 70% of Gaza's house in stock and living. By your count, some 37,000 Gazans dead, <laughs> many of them women and children. Yeah. So you could get Gaza back to exactly where it was on October 6th, in a ceasefire with Israel and no Israeli troops here. Yeah. Another Hamas victory like this and Gaza will be permanently unlivable. That, that, that's insane. It's like just like just ignoring one side of the story. Like, listen, I chose a side. I like the narrative I'm going with. I'm not going to change it. Like facts don't really play, play a role here. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't understand the very basic incentive system of Hamas. He, he's like, I'm living in a Western world in my very nice house in New York City or yeah. wherever. Yeah. Um, and if someone will destroy my house, if someone will kill my wife, that will be the end of the world for me. <laughs> so I assume anywhere around the globe, people think and see things exactly like this. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not working like this. Yeah, they they have so much fun, like uh, Hamas leaders. They have so much fun seeing the West, kind of like tripping over their uh, their traps and like falling into their narrative exactly how they want. And uh, yeah, they're they're not they're they're not stupid. That's for sure. They 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 understood the game and they know how to how to always twist it their way. Like I said before, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, they 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 built a everything's a story. If it's, if you're in business or in politics or in journalism. Obviously, every everything's a story, and they they're already building their stories for years, and and they're not letting go. Yeah, and 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 everything like the the text like we read right now, it proves their point of the West being weak, being lazy, uh, being out of history. They don't see the historical perspective. They don't see the the process, the the you know the goal, the redemption process they, they can't see it so of course yeah it will take a year two five ten hundred but at the end we will overcome and yeah. and, and win the west yeah that's that's our, that's our whole belief they're they're go, they're in for a long long term and the west doesn't know anything long term because everything here is instant if you if your phone doesn't doesn't react and within like 0, 0.0 whatever seconds then you're pretty frustrated. They they don't care. They're not looking into the, long, the short term game. They're in the long term game. And the West doesn't care because the West likes short wins, like showing uh, their companies got become public and uh, nice coffee houses and uh, and nice streets. Well. And they don't they don't care. Nobody's thinking about the long game, but they are. They're they're into it and they're gonna and they're thinking demographically about how many kids people are having in Europe and how many kids they're having. And they're they're fully invested into their story, and they're they're with it. It doesn't matter if they behead uh, children heads or put kids babies in ovens. There they have their story, and they're sticking to it. Yeah, and, and, and any the story is and any condition. Yeah, yeah. Holy huh? shit. Yeah, it's bigger and it's wider, and and we only see part of it right now. Um, so we can't understand the full picture. That's what justifies everything we saw. Like first you're responsible and not us because you are stronger now. And second, we see uh, God's plans 
and and, and we are working through it. So yeah, it's interesting. Also, they they're the only ones who have like a vision to God's plans. Like nobody else has that classification, and only they can see the bigger picture and uh, they're with their radical beliefs. Like what's what's God's aiming for? But nobody else has this access, and uh, there's a passcode, and only they have uh, the password. Yeah. Yeah. And the liberal world, the liberal order, is collapsing because it does not give us any good answer to 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 this problem, to this question, right? right, right. We it, it, we don't feel that the Western values, the liberal values, could defend our institution, our families, our communities. That's why people are going towards right, like that's why society becoming more polarized because people think. I will find answers in the populist radical right or in the progressive social justice world. Right. And because the, the liberal world, the liberal order yeah. can't give us the, the response we need. Right. It thinks only about self-fulfillment, about freedom. And we see that over and over again, it doesn't work in any other part of the world. Yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's, hard, to win, it's hard to win a war if, you, if you're so civil, you're civilized, you know. Like a lot of Israelis are kind of maybe even looking towards the thing. Maybe we should just act like animals, like they act like that. Like it's like people don't know what to do because people are so scared now, and especially and not maybe now a little bit less, but after seventh of October, people were so terrified that say if they're if they if they're breaking all the rules, maybe we should also start not not like them obviously, but maybe we should because people just don't know what to do. They don't know what to hold on to, and they know yeah. that these liberal uh, these liberal um. Yeah, uh, Shkafot, uh, these liberal um, views. views are just not, are not not holding water for them, and they're scared. Yeah, they don't see the 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 how we can leverage the liberal worldview into something smarter, stronger. Right. Um, like the, what happened yesterday in Lebanon was an example of how liberal world could be smarter, stronger. We can have connection with. Um, some factory in Hungary, and we can we, we think forward. We we think a step farther, yeah. um, and and that could be perfect. But that requires the West to become very honest, um, right. to self uh, examine itself all the time, and right. to speak about its values and what's good and what's not good. Um, right. But yeah, that that yeah, that was an amazing thing that happened yesterday. But. I think I think you also need a lot of motivation for that. Like I think now we're highly motivated because of the situation in Israel is not not ideal, <laughs> to say the least. And um, yeah. we don't we we're still we still have uh, oh, like oh, how many like probably like around sixty thousand evacuees from the north. So I, I I think that's kind of our motivation. But what happens when we don't have motivation? Like how do we how do we keep that ball running? And uh, actually, I'm going to give credit to uh, this debate I had at three, until three o'clock in the morning, uh, back back then, a little bit after so October seventh. I'll even give credit to Daniel Jacobi, that you also know, and uh, the kind of uh, only, only, only kind of only thing that he managed to convince me that that we choose life and they choose death. Meaning, the fact that we choose life and we that that's our values and our values are to live, um, and that's that's the holiest thing be, be in, uh, above everything. And there are values is. Is a whole, there's like radical uh, theo theological belief that and that you can we can also get to it by death and by holy war. Uh, that's the, the only convincing thing that he said to me. That not only like one of the convincing things he said to me that life is stronger than death and that's why we still have a, a winning chance. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. We we mm -hmm. we only need to remind ourselves to embrace the idea that. A world order by the West is a good idea because everything we know, because everything we believe in, because of our culture, because of yeah. our communities, because not because only we get a better coffee and more <laughs> rights and and even even if it comes to our rights, yeah. to our rights and to more freedom, it's not all about that. It's about being part of something, being part of a society, right. of culture. Uh, that what brings. Yeah. one uh, meaning but just, just uh, yeah in, sim in more simple times when everything's kind of more tame and more, more civilized so what what holds you like is that strong enough to uh, uh, against their radical ongoing fireball because when everything's okay you kind of forget about these problems and you, you kind of like kind of just like chill out not do too much like if somebody doesn't poke you you don't poke them back that's kind of like a west uh, west theory that Listen, we have 20 years of denial in, in, in Gaza, 
and now denial also since 2006 and north and you see when you when you get into deep denial uh, you see you 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 eat uh there are consequences yeah, yeah. you yeah you, there are serious consequences so when you just kind of let them do what they want yeah yeah maybe that's the crisis of the 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 world post the cold war where you don't have some enemy to fight that reminds right. you who you are so you're like yeah oh, the the world the end of history right as, right uh, someone said yeah also i heard another podcast this uh, uh, this woman who uh um who um she did, did an interview to yay lapid the former president of israel uh prime minister and um she said that always when we were growing up i guess we can also identify with this because we're, we're pretty much like the same age as she is she said um always i thought like i was learning about history and I heard about history. I heard it's a thing. I heard about wars. Now I feel like I'm part of history. And I think there's something we can like truly identify with that until the 7th of October. Okay. We had some things. We had some nice, uh, events that we were part of, but after the 7th of October, well, okay, we're part of this. Like we're, you're in history and now, now you're being, this Definitely. is real. Every, every move you do is, is pretty critical. And we've, until, fr we've been yeah. thrown back into Jewish history. Yeah, so we experience Jewish history once again. I, I guess it's exciting, but I, I, I don't know if I want it to be this exciting. <laughs> you would prefer the, the relaxed, calm, uh, liberal world of before. So yeah, in general, in general, yes. But uh, I'm also an, an action junkie. But, you know, obviously not not at any price like this. This is this is above my above my adrenaline uh, limits. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If, if, if you already like talked a little bit about choosing life and choosing um, yeah, I don't know if this is a good uh, introduction, but maybe to talk about a little bit of what's happening in the last uh, week and a half in Israel with um, with the deal. It, it might be a hypersensitive subject to a lot of people, so maybe we'll just try to talk about it, um, try to state out facts, try to um, draw out what we know today. That's why we have our professional here, Nadav. And... Yeah, we're not we're not going to give me and Adav, we're not going to give any any of our opinions. Yes, a deal, not a deal. Um, I think this is a really big question. I think it's super super complicated on many different le levels. Um, but yeah, maybe let's try to um, uh, dive into it. Even just with so there's there's people I spoke to over this week, friends of mine, who said that we got to such a situation that civilians have been kidnapped that um, even if it's a total loss, like we, they deserve, like, and it's our obligation pretty much to, to bring them back. Even though if it's, if it's waving up a white flag and saying, listen, we're doing this deal, it might even not be a good deal. It might even like, we have, we might have like pretty bad consequences, but this is, this is our obligation and we don't even want to win anymore. We just want the hostages back. So I don't know, I don't know how, how to even address this, honestly. It's like so sensitive. Um, but I don't know what's, what's your take about that in general? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you, you, you used a very interesting, um, claim and a very interesting thing we hear all the time about, um, the state's duty and responsibility, right. um, to bring everyone back because, because basically the state is the one who abandoned them on the 7th of October. Right. So, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's reasonable and makes sense. And state has the um, the duty to protect us, right. especially now, their, their civilians who were kidnapped from their house from a party, and they weren't yeah. they weren't an active duty or they weren't soldiers. Maybe even right, part right. of them have never been the army. Like, yeah, yeah, it's they're they are citizens. That's the most important part, maybe, of uh, state's duty. Right. I want to take you to like some like just to to understand this uh logic and this claim and to offer some more perspective about it mm -hmm. um this is all rooted in the idea we are familiar with uh called the social contract right you remember old days school yeah, yeah. Uh, when we learned about to sum it up basically once upon a time we all lived in a anarchy kind of thing um and we killed each other we mm -hmm. robbed each other and then we realized it's not sustainable and people came together and said okay you know what i'm giving up a little bit of my freedom because beforehand we had full, full, yeah full freedom, freedom full freedom um and um and in return i'm getting some um 
security, some, some safety uh, from this thing called the state. Or, yeah, it's a trade. Or, you get, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You trade your, your rights, your freedom in return of a more secure uh, existence. Um, yeah. And that's, that's how government uh, created or how law was created. Um, yeah. And since then, that's why we have governments and authorities and, and, and law and everything. Yeah. That's very uh, well-known theory. But um, we have to remember that even in the liberal philosophy, um, this is not the only explanation for the relationship between the state and the individual. There are many different forms of uh, republicanism that in its core claims something slightly different about the state. Basically says that the state isn't an insurance company, as we might see it, yeah. but rather a common project, something that defines one's identity and freedom rather than just defend mm -hmm. them. Um, and the most famous one probably is the idea of the general will, uh, in French is uh, Volonté Générale by uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. That is said, there is something that is bigger than the individual will. There is the general will. It's right. the society will. It's something that is, it's, it's the, you know, understanding uh, society as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's very dangerous, of course. Many, many philosophers after him pointed out very uh, correctly about the danger in it. You know, if if the general public want to do something that mm -hmm. is totally crazy, like, you know, kill all the right, redheads. Right. Yeah, that's... that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we have to agree that there is something in it. There, that, like, society is not merely a combination of individuals coming together. So what I want to say here, mm -hmm. um, that when we see society this way, like the Rousseau way or the Republican way, yeah. we realize that the state's duty to bring back every individual could be limited and heavily depends on the cost. Because it's not a purely moral issue. Of course, like we all want to see the hostages uh, returned um and and we all understand the, the the crisis between the citizens and the state after what happened october 7th and how right. the state abandoned them yeah we know we, we acknowledge it it's not it's not even a question of facts it's yeah, only and, we, and we how, all know and how how horrible it was and how we never experienced anything like this yeah. yeah and and it's not we can't let it happen again of course um but from now on, speaking about the deal, it's a strategic decision. Framing it solely on moral question mm -hmm. in which one of the sides is deeply immoral or doesn't care about the hostages is not only misleading, I think. Yeah. It's also dangerous because it's not the way we handle arguments yeah. in, in a democratic right. society. And I think that it, it, we hear all the time about the, the state's duty to bring them back. And we can acknowledge that, but there are different attitudes to society, to, to, to what we call the common project that is uh, the state. And right. sometimes there are hard decisions to make. And the fact we don't see here and now the consequences of the deal doesn't mean they don't exist. Right. Um, I think I think the biggest thing here. I mean, sorry, I'm really interrupting you. Is this, this we don't know the other side? Like nobody actually. This is a. I don't know if this is a disclaimer or this is obvious to everybody, but nobody knows what the deal is exactly. We kind of we kind of assume what the deal is, and also we never actually know the, our leaders' intentions, right? Because because yeah. if if Bibi, I heard this also. Another uh, I did a lot of homework for this podcast. So if uh, if Bibi also um, would say, okay, you know what? Um, Listen, the deal is really the the not doing the deal is really the best thing, and I'll, I'll prove it to you that after um, after the war, um, I don't know if you give me uh, you give me your your trust and you believe me that the deal is really not not in our favor in the long term or for Israel's security. I'm even willing I'm even willing to resign to quit, 
just just to make just to make a point that this deal is really important and the, the holding the Philadelphia Philadelphia corridor is is critical but like we don't have any we don't have any guarantee I think I think that's a hard thing about the deal we have no guarantee that that what 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 does it mean not doing the deal what's what's the future plans right. what is the plan is there a plan <laughs> yeah um, I, right. I, I think that's the hardest thing. Like, if we don't, we don't have like we don't have an uh, opposite. Um, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't have uh, an opinion. We don't not an opinion. We don't have. We don't. We just yeah. don't have, We have one side of the deal. So, to be to have such a discreet opinion to either side is so is in my in my eyes so difficult. Because, okay, yeah. you can assume it's still holding guys. It's still holding the main corridors. It's still uh, not allowing Hamas to to go back to power for, fully. But we don't actually know. And also, you don't know the consequences. And nobody's. Taking, yeah, and also nobody's taking any liability and saying, yeah, okay, yeah, you know what? If I just believe me, uh, I I have the deal. I can't tell you what the deal is. And you know what? I'm even willing. Like nobody's sacrificing anything, pretty much. Right. That's exa- yeah. I think that's that's more of a leadership crisis and, right. and a trust crisis we we experience, and that's that's right. totally right and unfortunate. You know, we don't trust our leadership. Uh, to get a decision because of the right incentives, we we say that they might get a decision based on their political interests. Um, and to say the least, it's not great uh, we, that we can't trust them. And I totally agree with you that if someone would have come with an idea like saying, "Listen, this is my view, and I'm willing to pay the political price for it. I'm not doing it like you claim I'm doing this because I." gain something politically for me right. so i'm telling you exactly the opposite i think only about the interest of the state of israel and that's why i'm gonna do it and then resign so you will understand that i have no political interest whatsoever right yet. right unfortunately that's i know you know nobody's willing <laughs> not something that anyone is considering yeah. um so i think that that's where the crisis is very very tough maybe maybe we should send this to other... Bibi as an idea maybe you just, you just, maybe you just didn't think about it like I think many, uh, many people, even in the right side of the Israeli political map, yeah. already said something like yeah. either resign or declare that the election will be at some point. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the, there is good yeah. reasons not to believe many things happening in Israeli politics. It's nowadays. really hard. It's really hard because you have to believe like our whole system, all the Western, how everything is built in this world is, yeah, it's a belief system. I can't know, every, I can't know everything. I can't, I don't know how to be a plumber and a doctor and a professor and a historian. So you have to yeah. believe people in a certain way. You can, you can maybe fact check, but if nobody's willing to take any, any risk in order just to risk or things to make a, make a point or, uh, yeah. any sacrifice so how i don't know yeah it's pretty crazy. It's, it's it's kind of the same crisis of of liberalism because liberalism is based upon the fact that if something bad is going on you resign in under your you know responsibility yeah. and institutions are important people respect the way institutions work <laughs> um and and etc so and that's not happening anywhere in the west like in many countries, not in many countries in the West, many, maybe in a few of them it's still okay, but in the US, in, in Israel, uh, in, in the UK also. So it's, it's very hard. And I think, I think the political leadership should take responsibility and even just by thinking about it and, and addressing the issue. But on the other hand, if yeah. the political leadership is not doing that, we as citizens, as, as citizens who are interested in a healthy society, we should manage the the, the whole discussion in a more, uh, yeah. I would say, tolerated way. Kind yeah, of. Yeah, but like I we think should yeah, have... I think it's just so hard to make a discussion like this when it's people's it's people's relatives and like such a small country that, like, right. you know, you know everybody here. Like uh, me yeah. personally, uh, I even even Hirsch, like he he grew was in my uh, elementary school, and he was in my youth with with in Akiva. Like I never spoke to him because we had like a big age difference, a uh, gap. But like I knew who he was. He was my uh, sisters and my good friends, um, uh, camper in Bnei Akiva. Like and also uh, yeah, even Almog Sahusi, he was also in the same unit. I like, it's so crazy how everybody knows someone, and it's hard to like be think about it so such a clear cut right, when, okay. yeah, yeah rational when it's such a small country and everybody's connected and there's no you should know if people are saying this to this abroad like there's no way that somebody like in israel you need like two connections to pretty much know everybody like if you want to know somebody in the north so maybe you don't know somebody but your friend knows someone yeah. um yeah no that's that's true i think 
we're lacking a vision. We're lacking an understanding of what's happening and where we are heading. And I think if that would have been something that mm -hmm. will be provided by, by the, our leadership, that would be totally different. If they will tell us, listen, yeah. the plan is to stay in Gaza for a few years to clean up everything and do that. And then uh, we'll try to establish some whatever right. Arab right. country based uh, government. I don't know something, but there is nothing. Yeah. I'm, we we're, we're, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's an easy, it's an easy decision to make or yeah, it's simple. But that, that, that's why you choose, you supposedly choose leaders who can make yeah, the tough calls that, easy. that you can Definitely make. It's not easy. And it does, doesn't need to be even short-term plan. It doesn't need to be tomorrow we will right, figure right. out the problem. It's only need to be, what's the direction? Where <laughs> are we <laughs> heading? Like, yeah. what's the plan? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully people like won't climb on the walls. So this another, another question that popped into my head about, um, a lot of people are like kind of, um, they hear about this Philadelphia corridor for like, I don't know if the first time, but it being such a big deal and having such big significance. And where did this come from? Where does BB like uh, his trick hat and where, where do you get, get this um, field of recorder? Why is it Piton? Why is it suddenly the most important thing in the world? And um, a lot of people are kind of questioning if it is it a thing? Is it just is it just uh, is it just an excuse? Uh, so you have a little, little bit of more our military and intelligence experience than I do. So if you can maybe, as you have maybe a take on that, uh, how significant is, is this and why, why did it just pop up suddenly? Yeah. Because so, it wasn't, so oh, just one sort of thing, was it wasn't in the, main, in the main plans of the war, right? The plans of the war yeah. was to bring back the hostages, destroy Hamas, and bring back everybody to their homes. So they had three goals, and this wasn't in one of the goals, right? Yeah, this is a mean, it's not a goal. Right. Um, let, let's say something like this. Um, the Philadelphia Corridor is a very strategic point indeed, no doubt about it. Um, though the whole argument, I think, about it got totally out of control for political purposes. Um, and, and why is it such a strategic point? Because Gaza um, could be described as an island, basically. One hand sea, one hand like one, the other side Israel, um, and one border with Egypt that is usually closed or under control. So how can you build an army or a terrorist army in Gaza? You need to smuggle things yeah. inside. How do you do that? For, from different angels and 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 and, yeah. and points, you know, mm -hmm. you can bring things through Israel, like as part of the humanitarian ad, you bring things that are could could be described or used in a more um, um, civilian way, I would say, right, right. and and use them maybe like things like purposes. like cement, cement or things like that. Just yeah, like... cement exactly. The dual purpose the yeah, um, right. materials. Like who who <laughs> thinks can... cement would get such a big purpose? Uh, but if it, like leave, leave leave it to Hamas to to make uh, yeah exactly, to, like, exactly from every from every lemon lemonade yeah exactly there are many yeah. things like this and many of them indeed came from uh, Israel itself. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things came through the Rafah border um, above the the, the ground, right. not underneath the ground. Um, people came from outside of uh, Gaza and brought back with them things in their suitcases, you know, smuggled things as, as people smuggled drugs around the world, you know. Um, they have the, their methods to do that. Mm -hmm. But the Philadelphia Corridor is definitely, was definitely used very heavily to smuggle a lot, a lot of things, especially big things, things that are harder to, to get through Maval uh, Erez for Israel, yeah. for, for Egypt. Uh, so I think when you see all these retired generals speaking in TV panels that it has no importance whatsoever, you're like, come on, guys, like, that's, that's not true. It <laughs> is important. It is very, uh, was used heavily by Hamas. The fact that Egypt denying that there were any tunnels yeah. crossing from it, Egypt to it has no interest. Gaza. There's no interest of. Uh, Come on, do me a favor. Yeah. Um, and we we only need to consider that it is not the only. Uh, it's not a standalone issue. So, if we would have got all the hostages back in return of withdrawal from Philadelphia corridor, would we do that? Yeah, probably yes. 
So saying that the Philadelphia corridor is the only thing, it's not true. It's a very important thing, but other things are important as well. Releasing thousands yeah. of terrorists from jail is also important, as we all know. Yeah. And withdraw from uh, the Netzarim corridor, it's also important. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's more corridors, by the way. I don't know if people know, but there's a few corridors and it's not, it's not the only few. one. Right, and, that, and, that, and that's how Israel kind of, that's how the army kind of controls what's happening there. Obviously, the control. Well, you, not you really controlling, but yeah. yeah. No, but it's Sarin Corridor, a lot of a lot of events happen there, and it's it's uh, it's not so easy to hold, but it's it's, it's a strategic place. Like the IDF yeah. wouldn't hold these corridors if it wasn't give them a strategic um, controlling of if terrorists are going for the north to south or uh, opposite way or etc. Yeah, yeah. So overall, it's like it's a strategic question, and you can't judge it by a specific element. You you need to see the whole the whole picture in order to make a um, rational judgment about whether it's worth it or not. Uh, and I think the, the, the argument we had a week ago about the Philadelphia corridor was part of the general public discourse that went out of control yeah. and is not based on anything is very, very uh, not rational and, and, you yeah. know, it's all sensitive and yeah emotional it is it is it really is it's like it's it's, it's so it's so horrible the situation and, and even if somebody has a opinion that he, he doesn't agree to the deal obviously everybody wants everybody back um it just like, people are scared people are scared of giving up control of you're already, you're already in there with the army um will it, be, will it be easy to go back will it not be easy to go back will there be more casualties less casualties I, um nobody's i don't think anybody in israel at least anybody who's kind of sane thinks that uh, yeah everybody wants the hostages back that's what i'm just trying to say yeah yeah 100 uh, maybe maybe like la last question for today um bb speaks about it in his kind of his nice uh presentation after <laughs> um that he says um this is not the timing to to accept a deal and what's and not not the timing that's not the main point the main point is what message is it is after they killed six hostages is making a deal now so do you think that plays a part or do you think that's kind of a spin that bb does what's your what's your take about that mm, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what i think i think hamas generally speaking isn't interested in a deal mm -hmm. that will not ensure its uh, ability to rehabilitate itself as um uh, as the sovereign in gaza um so it's either we will give up and we'll give Hamas what he wants, or there will be no deal. And by giving Hamas what he wants, I'm not saying surrounding. I'm saying maybe we assume, for good reasons, that we can get back to the war after a few weeks or a few months, or we can handle the situation. Mm -hmm. I think it's naive nowadays to, to think yeah. like this because we saw what happened the 7th of October. But mm -hmm. you can, like, it's legit to, to, to claim that we, we will be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and why is that? Because there's no real pressure from the Gazans about the situation. Hamas is controlling very much the uh, civil life in Gaza, uh, both in terms of humanitarian aid and in terms of policing. Yeah. Um, and and that's quite tough when you don't have any pressure coming from your own population. And also, this whole fact of attrition war isn't something that's so bad for them. Like, even if, if, if I can quote from memory what uh, Sinwa started sending um, um, letters to different Arab uh, leaders recently. Mm -hmm. And he said one to Abdel Malik al Houthi, uh, the leader of the Houthis <sighs> in Yemen. And he said something like, um, We prepared ourselves for this kind of long war. Uh, for a war, for a tuition war, mm -hmm. um, and we will break their stability, their political stability, the same way we broke their military one in uh, yeah. what they called Alexa flood. So, do they really want? Like, when we speak about this, still we should remember that it's a two side game. Like, we should ask ourselves, what do they want? Mm -hmm. Why do they want it? Yeah. Um, and how can we ensure that what that they want isn't right. something that we cannot allow ourselves to to happen. Um, so uh, 
particular yeah a particular time after alien six hostages yeah if if sinwar will get a message that after murdering people the pressure is getting stronger on our side right so why wouldn't he just kill some more to to make the pressure even stronger and pay you know smaller price for him so so i just want to say so Nadav, this is super interesting today and um I think the discussion was really relevant and kind of passed through also also history, also actual, actual things that are happening today. And yeah, I hope um, hope there's not a last podcast together. Also, I hope I hope the next time uh, we meet uh, soon, maybe next time, I guess I have to come to you. I think I think that's our deal. Yeah, uh, bring all the equipment with you and come to London. Yeah, I'll, I'll come. We can switch, you know, I'll 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 uh, I'll shoot from London and you'll come here and you can use the room. Definitely. Sounds like a deal. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Sounds was... like a deal. Thank you. Thank you. It was really interesting. And thanks for the opportunity. And I hope uh, we'll have uh, good news in yeah. any aspects we spoke about. Yeah, maybe you do a podcast about good news. It won't be so interesting, but yeah. <laughs> if, it, if, 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 if it ever hard. happens, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.